Hi everyone, and welcome back to the lab. In this video, I'll be making copper chromite, which is useful as a decarboxylation catalyst for heterocyclic rings that have lone pairs of electrons. Uh, so things like niacin, which is uh, like pyridine with an acetyl group on it, can be decarboxylated to form pyridine, which is uh, an interesting and useful amine in the laboratory, and I'll be doing that actually in an upcoming video. So I decided to make the catalyst in this one. I'll be making the catalyst using the following series of reactions. The main reaction to note is the reaction between ammonium chromate and copper sulfate to precipitate a copper ammonium chromate here. Um, and then the copper ammonium chromate will uh, decompose when heated to form these various copper chromite compounds here, which is the target that we're after. There are actually many, many of those compounds, and uh, it's difficult to characterize the exact uh, empirical formula of the copper chromite, so it's just sort of used as a, uh, a catalyst that's understood to be a mixture of a, a bunch of compounds. And the same thing goes for the uh, intermediate copper ammonium chromate here. It has many different chemical formulas, but that's approximately the empirical formula. Now I don't have ammonium chromate, so what I'll be doing is making ammonium chromate from ammonium dichromate. If you watch my video on chromium trioxide, you'll understand that if I add a base to a solution of a dichromate, I can force the, uh, the equilibrium toward chromate. So essentially what I'll be doing is reacting one equivalent of ammonium dichromate, which I have in stock, with two equivalents of ammonium hydroxide, which uh, is the ionized form of ammonia dissolved in water. And that will react to form um, two equivalents actually of ammonium chromate, so I need to correct that actually, two equivalents of ammonium chromate and uh, one equivalent of water, which I didn't include for brevity. In summary, I'll be taking a solution of ammonium dichromate and adding ammonia to it to make ammonium chromate. The ammonium chromate solution will then be added to copper sulfate solution, which will precipitate copper ammonium chromate. We can then filter the precipitate and dry it, and then finally heat it to about 350 to 400 Celsius to, to uh, affect its conversion to copper chromite right here. And then uh, I'll be doing a fourth step, which is washing this copper chromate product in uh, a weak solution of acetic acid to remove some copper oxide that is co-formed during this process and that'll help reduce side reactions during the decarboxylation use of this catalyst because uh, copper oxide tends to, at the high temperatures anyway, uh, oxidize organic compounds. So let's get to the lab and get started. I'll start by weighing out the reactants and getting them in solution. Uh, that requires 12.6 grams of ammonium dichromate and uh, 25 grams of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. Um, and this represents a 1 tenth molar scale. I'll be dissolving the, uh, the ammonium dichromate in 33 milliliters of water. And I'll get a stir bar in that. And I will dissolve the copper sulfate in 60 milliliters of water and that will require a bit of microwaving to get in the solution. So it'll be pretty close to boiling. Very colorful solutions. When the dichromate has dissolved, and you'll be able to tell because it, uh, of course, forms a nice crystal-free orange solution, um, we'll add 42 milliliters of 10% uh, aqueous ammonia very slowly with rapid stirring. And this is going to, of course, convert the dichromate to chromate. And you'll know the dichromate is uh, orange, the chromate is mostly green, so we're going to get something uh, somewhere in between. Very carefully. Oh, and you can see the color just starting to change right there. And there we go. One solution of aqueous ammonium chromate. Next I'll get the copper sulfate solution, which I used the microwave briefly to uh, make sure that it was all dissolved. And of course it makes a nice dark blue solution. Well, that's sort of light blue, I guess. Um, I'm going to add a stir bar very carefully to it. I'll get that stirring. And then uh, we'll add the dichromate solution, or the chromate solution, I should say now, uh, very slowly to the copper 2 sulfate, again with rapid stirring. And here we should see the precipitate of the copper ammonium chromate complex. This reaction will produce a little heat. And you can see the brick red color of the copper ammonium chromate precipitate forming, as well as some steam. Oops, that was a mistake, but I added <laughs> two stir bars, okay. Yep, careful about that, I forgot to stick it to the bottom of the magnet, but that's live chemistry for you. No harm done, but thankfully we didn't break the beaker. And I'll let this react for approximately five minutes with stirring uh, to make sure that everything is completely reacted. 
All right, I've set it now for vacuum filtration, and uh, I've got the solution here, or the mixture now, with the uh, precipitate, of course. I'll filter that out, and uh, first, this time, I'm going to stick the stir bars to the bottom of the beaker with a magnet. Don't forget that. That's how you break a lot of glassware. All right, let me get the vacuum on. I apologize for the noise. So this stuff is proving quite difficult to filter. Uh, it's because it's such a fine precipitate, it's forming this mud in here. Um, if you ever have a difficult vacuum filtration like this, you can always try uh, very carefully, uh, so not to damage the frit, uh, to scrape the hard, the hardened uh, precipitate against the frit, or uh, off the frit, that is, and allow fresh solution to touch the frit, and you can usually get it to start back up again. And then you'll end up agglomerating a big pasty lump of the, uh, of the filtrate right in the middle. So that's what I'm trying to do right here. You can see it's working to some extent. All right, well this filtration is really giving my uh, vacuum pump hell. You can see it's, uh, I'm having trouble filtering it uh, down for any more than this chocolatey paste. So I can't pull any more water out of it simply because uh, the precipitate is so fine it's clogged with a frit. And uh, also there's a hard barrier right here of this precipitate that's packed on top of the frit as I suck the water out of it. That's preventing any further uh, of the solution from getting through. So we're just going to go ahead and dry this now. It, the residual salts that are in here that are in solution um, with this stuff aren't really going to matter. So um, we're just going to go ahead and put this on a glass pan and get it on a water bath and uh, dry it out. You know, this stuff isn't the worst to work with. It's uh, it doesn't smell. It's you know, it's a chromium compound, so obviously you don't want to eat it or ingest it or breathe it, but it's hard to breathe in paste form. And it looks kind of like chocolate. Don't eat it though. Let me get my spatula for the rest of that. Alright, this is about good. Honestly, I'm sick of messing with it. This makes way more than I'm going to need. A little bit of this catalyst goes a long way, so I'm just going to stop making a mess here and uh, get on with my life. Let's get this on the water bath. In case you've ever wondered, the water bath is just simply this electric pot here, which I've got set to simmer, which is just under the boiling point of water, and it just creates a whole bunch of steam uh, underneath the bottom of the pan here, so I can put stuff on top and uh, leave it in the fume hood, and it'll uh, it'll dry right up. I pre-filled it with some hot water from the sink, so it doesn't take as long, and uh, I'll probably spread that out a little bit as well. Spread it out. Yeah, it's been about 35 minutes, and you can see that... Uh, quickly getting these rock hard lumps of powder progressing quite nicely. I'm just now going to begin to start crushing these at the bottom of a beaker before they get uh, too hard to do so. Still a little bit pasty, some of it's sticking to the bottom of the beaker, but we've now greatly increased the surface area, which will allow this to dry much faster and also reduce the amount of work we're going to have to do later pulverizing this. Alright, so I've been crushing and stirring this intermittently over the last uh, 20 minutes or so, and uh, you can see it's now a coarse sort of rust-colored powder here. It's uh, mostly brown, but maybe a little hint of red. Anyway, this is the uh, ammonium copper chromate, and uh, the next step, of course, is to heat this up and uh, pyrolyze it to the copper chromite catalyst that we need. And that requires temperatures of 350 to 400 Celsius, which is pretty darn hot. So I'm going to go ahead and take this out of the pan and load it into a crucible, and we can do that with a Bunsen burner. And there we go. All right, so I've got my uh, copper ammonium chromate in this crucible up here, and I'm just going to place the lid on that to prevent uh, air from reaching it. Um, I've got this Bunsen burner down here. It's a homemade uh, burner affair here, connected to the gas jet, and uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and light this. I'm gonna start by heating this rather gently. Uh, you, can, you might be able to see the flame. I assure you it is there. Let me get the lights. There, you can kind of see it. Um, heat this gently at first. You can see we're, we're at 136-ish C. Uh, just to make sure all the water is driven off. I'll, I'll do this for about 10 minutes uh, to assure uniform temperature of the powder and then I'll crank up the heat and we'll get this going to uh, 
approximately 350, somewhere 350 to 400. All right, I've been slowly roasting it about 230. It's uh, the temperature's been slowly rising. I am now going to raise the Bunsen burner with a little block of wood, and uh, we'll really start uh, torching this thing. All right, well the catalyst has been uh, cooking in the crucible at you know, roughly 400 C. A little off the scale there on the bar there, but uh, roughly 400 C for about 10-12 uh, minutes now. I think it's just about done. And we can actually check that by removing the lid. I'm just going to turn the flame off here. And if we take a quick peek, we'll see that it has turned black. And that is good. That's uh, black on the top that is sort of indicative that the entire uh, contents of the crucible have been reacted so uh, we can just let this cool now. Now a word of caution this is actually an improper way of heating a crucible in, on a ring like this. Uh, usually you'd use a bigger ring with a piece of mesh over the top and that's because the ring and the ceramic have different coefficients of thermal expansion so as the ring cools it'll eventually crush the crucible since the crucible is ceramic and has a very low coefficient of thermal expansion. So I'm going to just remove the crucible here and uh, place it on a metal surface to cool down completely so that uh, it doesn't break with the ring squeezing it. The catalyst is now cooled and you can see it's a fine black powder. Now the next step is washing the catalyst with a weak acid to remove copper oxide and the reason for that is because many organic compounds can be oxidized by copper oxide especially at elevated temperatures under reflux which is kind of uh, the, the condition. aren't too crazy so um, you know they're not going to occur at high yield at all but uh, they do affect the yield so I'm going to go ahead and wash this just to ensure that we have a pure product. Now to wash this um, all we're going to do is just rinse it in a weak acid in this case we're going to use acetic acid. Uh, I'm going to make a solution of 10% acetic acid here by uh, I have 120 milliliters here of uh, just 5% distilled vinegar uh, and again the purity isn't really of paramount importance here. Uh, since we're just washing it, and uh, I'm going to boost its concentration uh, to 10% by adding um, 6 milliliters, or it's roughly 6 grams of uh, commercial glacial acetic acid. I'm then going to get that stirring with a stir bar, which we've got nice and homogenized. And then I'll add the catalyst to begin washing it. Just get her out of the crucible here. Some very fine dust. There we go. And I'm going to let that stir for approximately 10 minutes, and then uh, we'll go ahead and make a separate solution in the meantime of an equal concentration and volume of acetic acid and then we'll decant as much of that as possible and then uh, rewash with some more of the other solution and that should complete the washing. We'll just do a quick filtration after that. All right, it's been about 10 minutes. I'm turning off the stirring and we're just going to let this settle as much as possible. After about 10 more minutes I'll decant the supernatant liquid and uh, add this fresh portion here of 10% acetic acid. And then we'll just repeat the process and then we can filter, wash, and dry the product. Alright, so the solution is settled and you can see there's a dark green uh, supernatant liquid above a black layer. It's still a bit turbid because of the fineness of the, of the precipitate there, or the powder I guess. So uh, we're just going to pour this off carefully, but I am first going to use a magnet to control the stir bar. Just like that. Um, that green color, that emerald green, is indicative of copper acetate. You can see that as we pour this off. any of the precipitate in there. Pour this awkwardly so you can see it. Eh, that's about good enough. I don't want to get too much of the catalyst in there. And there we go. So now for the second washing. Um, uh, again, I've prepared the acetic acid solution. Just pour this in. It's 
stir for 10 minutes and settle for 10 minutes. To remove the raw ammonium copper chromate from the plate and stuff like that, that water is, is ineffective. Obviously we know it precipitated so it's not soluble. So if I add water here you can see that uh, yeah, it just makes some sort of a turbid solution there. But uh, of course we can drive that equilibrium uh, back to a solution based uh, set of ions by adding a strong acid. So I'm going to add some muriatic acid, it's hydrochloric acid, 31.45%, and I'll just add a little bit. Do this with safety goggles. And you can see immediately it destroys the precipitate and the glass comes out perfectly clean and uh, ready for drying the uh, chromite catalyst, which of course is uh, still starting over there. All right, so this is the last washing of the catalyst. It's already settling a little bit. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and filter it again. I've set up, once again, for uh, vac infiltration here. It's just convenient and quick. Uh, I also have some distilled water which I'll be using to rinse the acetic acid from the product with. So let me get the vacuum on. Agitate this a little bit and then I'll dump it through. I'm gonna get the distilled water. Yeah, I'm putting approximately 35 milliliters in here just to wash it down. And this is where it's handy to have a wash bottle of uh, deionized water laying around so you can rinse the last out of the beaker if you need to. All right, this is about as dry as the suction filtration will allow, so uh, I now have our freshly cleaned glass drying plate, and uh, again, we'll get the water bath going, and I'll just uh, scrape this out onto the plate. You can see this powder is much better behaved. It's a uh, chunky, easily split up black powder compared to uh, the paste that we were dealing with earlier. And again, when you're doing this, always be careful. You don't want to damage your frit. So if, if at all possible, don't scrape your frit with metal instruments like this. I'm just barely touching it. It does make a nasty noise, but um, if you do it too hard, you'll dig into the glass and weaken the frit, and then you can potentially have it implode on you while you're vacuum filtering. All right, I've got it drying on the water bath. It should be dry in approximately 20 minutes with some uh, mild heating. This catalyst is safe to be exposed to the air and things like that, so you're not gonna degrade the activity by leaving it out. Uh, it's not degraded by moisture or oxygen, so that's good. Anyway, uh, we'll just leave this uh, to dry, like I said, for about 20 minutes, and uh, the solution of copper acetate that we filtered from it can uh, just be discarded down the sink. There's nothing particularly harmful about that. This stuff ends up as a coarse gray powder and it's extremely easy to crush these lumps with the beaker. Just a few more minutes of drying and this should be essentially water free. Alright, the powder is now completely dry and uh, ready to be put into a bottle. So here's the final yield. It's 12.4 grams of a coarse uh, sort of gray-green powder uh, that is copper chromite. Now this will be used in an upcoming video where I manufacture pyridine from, uh, from niacin by running a decarboxylation on it. Uh, this, co this copper chromite catalyst can actually be used for hydrogenations as well, uh, but unfortunately uh, those that particular version of the copper chromite catalyst also includes a barium chromite uh, mixture with the copper chromite which prevents sulfate catalyst poisoning because the barium of course precipitates sulfates has a very insoluble sulfate so uh, not really useful for hydrogenation this particular version but you can uh, make a version that is useful for that anyway uh, I really enjoyed making this video and uh, many of you uh, support this channel which is really great by the way I have a patreon account that's what I'm talking about um, if you'd like to donate something as small as a dollar that would be amazing because uh, with a lot of you guys and uh, a lot of donations, that's, well, a lot of dollars. So I can use those to improve the quality of the videos and buy better stuff and show you how to make uh, more awesome things. So anyway, if you like the video, please press the like button. If you'd like to see more videos, uh, please press the subscribe button. And uh, as always, thank you very much for watching.